thanks everybody for being here. Um, I know we've spent a lot of time in DeSalle lately, um, and we're all eager, eager to get to the studios. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, so we've had the privilege of having Jane Lackey here with us since yesterday, uh, when she gave us some very generous studio visits and held a really lively seminar with the first years about making the most of their time at Cranbrook. Uh, Jane served as the artist in residence of the fiber department here at Cranbrook from 1997 until 2007. She had previously headed the fiber department at Kansas City Art Institute. Jane's work has been exhibited internationally and throughout the US and has been recognized through numerous awards, grants, and commissions. She currently lives and works in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Her visit with us here is in conjunction uh, with showing work at the Birmingham Bloomfield Art Center uh, in the show Adaptation, Transforming Art, or Transforming Books into Art, which opens tonight at six, and I hope as many of you as possible will join us for that opening. Um, so without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Jane Lackey. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Mark and Fiber Department, for putting up with me <laughs> while I'm here. It's been really nice to be here. It's, uh, I feel very comfortable and familiar here at this podium. Um, and thank you all for coming, especially those who came from far away. <laughs> um, partially because of something that we were reading for the seminar I did with the first years, I've been thinking a lot about the idea that um, most artists have kind of one elemental thing to say and that we constantly repeat the same theme in our work. Um, so, you know, I started thinking about that related to me and for me, I think it's, I would say it's an involvement with place, um, the poetics of space. Yes, I have a dog-eared -ear version that I've been reading for many, many years. Um, my work is diverse, though, and uh, projects change according to influences and context. Um, but it's not all open-ended. I have a range, and the subjects that I deal with revolve around identity, unspoken communication, memory, movement, language, human connection. I make drawings, installations, sculptures, bookworks, and prints. And usually they're carried out in the materials of cloth, felt, chalk, tape, cord, scrim, stickers, wood, and paper. What con consistently repeats throughout my work, beginning with very early process-based work uh, weavings to the recent installations, are two overriding actions. First, I'm always drawn to the micro components of physical matter and the smallest particles of language, code, um, little bits, granules, synapses, cells, the abstract parts that coexist through tension and elasticity of systems. Uh, a few years ago, I was listening to an interview with Heather McHugh, who is a poet who explores the materiality of language and she had just received the MacArthur grant, so she's a genius, when um, asked what she would be doing with her newfound time and money, McHugh mentioned that when she was young, she and her sister would lie on their beds and they would just slow down speech until the parts of words were like disconnected granules rolling off the tongue in a gravelly voice. So she would return to those basics and work with formations of sound as matter. How confirming it is to hear that someone from another genre, when someone from another genre articulates your own affinity, I could feel that gravelly rolling and playing with language in um, my throat and hear it in between the beats. Her description pinpointed my interest in small bits of matter language and the threshold between speech and silence. My second passion that almost always follows the first is to take the bits and parts and arrange them in space, give them form, find a place for them, connect what is disconnected, compare what is different, map to remember, materialize to sense, and systematize to order. Mapping is both active and passive. If you are a map reader, we're like voyeurs. 
we crawl along at a line with our eyes, noticing other lines, the little dot of green, the tiny text, an arrow, the campsite. The shift from actual space to flat space suspends us while we build mental pictures of what doesn't exist on the paper or on the screen. Otherwise, we m walk, move, circulate, and map with our bodies, our car, our transport. Mapping is foot and hand work. It's the process and all the intending sensations of being lost or grounded. And thinking in ma motion changes the way our brain works. Over the years, I've followed how scientists are researching the body, the genome, the brain. This ongoing endeavor of mapping smaller and smaller bits of in information rendered in code has been a constant resource and model for almost all my projects. From that frame of reference, I'm, sh I'm gonna start with the book works and I'm showing uh, Webster's line um, as you know, I'm here for uh, an opening of a group exhibition, Adapta Adaptation, Making Art from Books. Uh, the books I work with are always found dictionaries, and the words and genetic sequences that I use are found text. So my book works are fundamentally a comparison of two systems, language and genetic code, and the variants within those systems that shift and change identity or meaning. Our genetic code is, is sequenced with four letters and they, those are repeated and number around three billion. And then the dictionary has about a half a million words. Um, and that's growing all the time. The slide you're looking at is a detail from a um, work called Case. Uh, it's, it's in the collection at the DIA, so it's been on exhibition, it's been on display here. Um, it's part of a series I call stanzas, and what you're seeing are letters that are laser engraved into cut dictionary pages that have been uh, layered with gesso. So uh, this is a new stanza, it was made uh, this year, and stanzas repeat and go on forever with variation. So given the number I just mentioned, I have a very open-ended uh, series that I'm working with. Uh, and this is a detail from uh, another body of work, a uh, series of work that numbers about 24, um, titled Snips, Slips, and uh, made these in 2002 and three, and I'll also be showing a few of those. Um, throughout this series, I'm comparing DNA sequences that show mutations, and those are called SNPs. Uh, it's an acronym spelled capital S-N-P, but pronounced SNPs. And I'm comparing those with slips of speech, thus the title SNP slips. And what I've done is remove the um, dictionary covers and laser engrave the two texts into the covers and then uh, taken the pages of the book, which have been sliced and altered and recessed into, their position has been altered. They haven't really been touched in any other way than cutting. And then those are recessed into a wooden frame so that you see the pattern of the ink marks, which are just indications of partial words. And that's just caused by the way they're cut and positioned. Selecting from a collection of slips of speech, I compose short writings. And then um, somewhere on the dictionary page, this is I mean, on the cover, um, this is a, from a different piece on the right, a detail of the sequence of DNA, the SNP, uh, that has a mutation or a misordering uh, somewhere along each book uh, somewhere along on each book cover. And um, the reason I am pairing these is, is partially due to the fact that both systems are, uh, it's a, both systems study mistakes in order to 
understand language and understand our genetics. And I became interested in the fact that it's the flaws that really tell us uh, more about ourselves than perfection. The books are usually arranged in groups um, and they're somewhat participatory as people um, tend to read them aloud as they walk along. Ledger is an assembly of multilingual dictionaries uh, in their parts and then written to, uh, text are also engraved into the assembly of covers that are there. Um, and the written texts regard loss and pain, and they're referring both to per personal and cultural loss. And then speaking of genetics, this is my mother, uh, which she drove <laughs> uh, her bookmobile around in the mountains of Tennessee when she was very young. And, um, I've been, I came from a very, very much a reading family. We were all, you know, kind of had our books in our faces. And um, this always, I, I don't think I even saw a photograph of this until I was doing the work that I was doing and I happened to find it. I just always heard stories about it. But um, I have been in exhibitions where there are contemporary versions of portable libraries, bike, bike mobiles, like bookmobiles, push carts, things like that. I really think, though, her version is the best. Um, in 2005, I had an artist residency fellowship at the Camargo Foundation in Cassis, France. And um, you have to, of course, make a proposal before you are accepted in a residency. And so my proposal was titled Map Room, in which I suggested I would map the DNA of the um, location of the place, the foundation, Camargo. And um, I would use the small studio there, the artist studio, as a um, measuring device or a, a way that I would decide the scale of the map because I wanted the map to encircle the room there. Um, I had not seen the room, I'd just seen plans of it. Um, what I thought I meant by DNA of the of Camargo would be something that was more enduring and constant, maybe something about the buildings or the site. But when I actually got there, I realized that the most interesting thing going on were the people. And um, so I shifted and decided to, to map the thing that was most ephemeral. So the sub subject uh, became the creative pool that we formed as a random group of writers, composers, scholars, and me, the visual artist. Uh, and we were there together for about half a year. I want to just say something about um, my process of drawing or, or making works on paper. Um, and I've been using this process for about over, over 10 years. Um, and I made the drawings for this project map room that I'm going to show you in this way, and I continue to use it in the drawings that I'm doing now. It's a relatively simple, intuitive manner of drawing on paper with tape, stitched thread, labels, stickers, and thin layers of paint. And so I use uh, really strong Japanese kozo paper that is strong, but it's also translucent, so you can see through it slightly. It has a kind of skin-like quality. And um, it holds up to the, this process of working rather heavily with materials that I put on them and um, with the paint that will, of course, make paper buckle. Uh, and then also the process of working back and forth between table and wall. So for each person, um, I made a panel that um, each one has a line that runs across that is a kind of consistent line. And then at some point, there's a deviation where the lines circulate. And that was the symbol that I developed for each of the, art, uh, of the people in residence. And what happens then is, is there's 
there are marks left over in the paper that have no paint on them, so they remain translucent, and they're like kind of light notes. And then there are marks that are made where stickers or circles have, dots have gone over uh, tape, so those are much darker and keep up a kind of beat and a kind of interval. Along the bottom edge of the paper are sewn um, inches of thread, and they're marking the inches of the map, so they're, they're spaced every six inches. And so then those panels were linked up to form lines, and they're presented on wooden panels that slant out from the wall just a little bit, so it's a little bit like a music stand that, where the, the paper is um, out a little further at the lower edge. And it's a quite a narrow piece, so you can sit in the middle and look at it, but really what it calls for is walking around the room, moving around the room, and looking very close and intimately at the marks that are there. Um, I also made an appointment to meet with each uh, person that was there and to meet in their studio space and make a photograph of them, which I really enjoyed as part of this process of, of, of making a map for them as well because it actually gave me a very nice time to talk to them about their work and um, to see a little bit about how they were working. It's another couple of sections in the gallery. Uh, later when I came back, I showed the work and it encircled the gallery space at Limburg, which doesn't exist now, and then later over at Roy Boyd Gallery in Chicago. Um, I also included a large um, legend for the map, which included those symbols referring to each person, and then each symbol um, was marked with initials, uh, and you could look and see what those people were doing or studying while they were there. The, you're really looking at the top where it says Panorama. That was the title of, of that piece that I just described, and it was also the name of the main building at Camargo, um, because it has an, an amazing panoramic view, and, um, but it also suggests other things about what goes on there. Uh, I did a second group of works that were titled Survey, and they mapped, in a sense mapped, the discussions uh, that we had. We each presented our work to each other in a much more well, informal discussion, but uh, something that we had prepared. And so I've continued to make works that call attention to, to um, people and the subtle links of communication. In 2010, I was in an exhibition at the Art Gym near Portland, Oregon, and it was titled Choreograph. It was a two-person show exploring communication and movement. Uh, both of us were interested in tracking the choreography of personal and social actions over time. And um, this is a diagram of a human mobility study. Uh, so what was happening is that cell phones were being um, tracked and charted um, in uh, tracking how people moved around on a daily routine and over a set period of time in a particular locale where there were a number of cell phone towers. Early uh, metadata. People got worried about this, this too. Um, I titled it Translocation, call and, uh, I titled my work based on, on this translocation call and response. It just kind of became the, the background for that work, um, which is a painting on a solid black brocade fabric that has an inlaid pattern of circles on it. So the inlaid pattern was, of course, just in raised circles in thread. So I used those as the points where lines converge and pull against each other, uh, creating a kind of tension and then um, suggesting a sort of a diagram of choreographed dance sequence where um, tension and release between partners is, is really crucial to the dance, or uh, just suggesting a massive interconnected phone conversation. 
And it was made specifically for a wall that um, is um, there at the art gym, which was quite large. So it was about 27 feet. And it really, again, um, as the map room panorama piece did, it sort of forced people to walk along it to actually see it and also to get up close, although this does not have the kind of detail that the, the drawings I showed you has. Um, you really have to walk along it to see it though. And it was a step towards um, the more participatory work that I'm doing now and I'm much more interested in at this point. So at the art gym, I had an opportunity to do an installation. There was just a small, little small project room that happened to be right next to that translocation call and response. And I wanted to see if I could stimulate an active conversation in real time rather than referring to something that had been charted or mapped um, over a period of time in the past. And I decided that uh, writing was what I wanted to try to um, encourage, or drawing, or diagramming. So this is a point where, again, I think the work, my work shifted a little bit in terms of realizing um, that there's a lot of uh, interest on my part in, in enlisting the action, the activity and participation of an audience, but there's also a lot of interest on my part in uh, trying to create a context for that, and, th and that's sort of what I've been working on in uh, past works, or in, excuse me, more recent works. So here the um, entry was quite obvious, and the chords with the, uh, that are suspended uh, with chalk at the end are easily seen from the larger gallery space. So that kind of shininess and hanging quality, shimmery quality of the chords kind of pulled people in. Uh, there was just a small invitation written on the right side uh, for people to join in with diagram writing or um, drawing. And there was absolutely no hesitation. It was absolutely full at the opening and continued to um, attract writers during the course of the show. Um, the space was small, so my idea was to t tier the chalk and layer it, space the lines of chalk a little bit away from each other so that it, it kind of felt like the whole space was a little more dense than it actually was. So here you're just looking right down the center of it where most people, although you never know, most people would not walk in a three inch space. They were on the outer side of it and pulling the cords over to write on the wall or to do whatever they wanted to do. Some people just, because the cords are attached to um, rubber bands, long, very long orange rubber, rubber bands that go up to hooks, it makes them even more, um, they have even more tension, so, and they kind of jiggle a little bit if, with movement, so people got excited about just exercising with the cords and making a line, and, uh, or making a circle on the wall, and kids uh, were turned loose inside and began to tangle it, uh, especially at the opening. And what happened, I tend to make things that are kind of fragile and they require some sensitivity. I was trying to kind of balance the exuberance and the sensitivity, but um, what happened is that the, the cords had to be tended, they had to be untangled a little bit, and people just pitched in and did it. They just kind of naturally did it. So I learned something from that about um, what can happen, especially when the room fills and there's a no negotiation of space and uh, that kind of forcing of attention and care in a situation where things can get out of hand. Um, and I think the aspect of, of being sensitive becomes part of the piece. It becomes part of the content. And the question, of course, is how to tease out uh, more considered writing that sub says something about our time and place. This was done in November of, um, two, there, was, there were elections that were happening right around that time, and, oh, 2010, yeah, there were, 
elections that were happening in the and uh, so I was curious to see if there would be any political content. There was some. Uh, I thought there might be more. And just after doing that installation, I um, had written a proposal for a grant from the Japan Friendship Commission, which offers a fellowship in Japan. Uh, at that point, it was for five months. And um, it's to go, just to go to Japan and really study things or be involved with things that you're interested in that might influence your work. It's really about the artist's work and what will, what will feed the work. Residents don't live together, you find your own spot. So uh, my works involving circuitry and movement and participation made me curious to know more about the Buddhist and Shinto pilgrimage circuits. And they are usually referred to as circuits. They usually work in a kind of circular uh, sequence. Not all of them, but some of them do. And we visited hundreds of temples and walking paths and crisscross sites from Shikoku to Kyoto to Nara, Mount Koyasan, and surrounding area. So our map that we were, tr my husband was able to go with me, that's the we. Um, we were able, you know, we kept trying to keep track of where we'd gone and just kind of kept linking up how did we get to this one, to that one? Um, one thing I was aware of that would be there would be marks and things that were left um, on the paths, but I just didn't know how prolific they would be or what they would be. So I was really interested in the accumulation and the accretion of material traces that people leave as they pass through a complex or um, as they uh, try to complete, complete a pilgrimage route. And sometimes it's things like uh, pieces of cloth that are tied and left, and many of them you know, have been there a long time and changed due to weather. Um, over the years, pilgrims have placed name stickers um, as high as possible up into the rafters of a lot of the temples, and particularly along the gates and ceilings and um, or they've placed folded paper to hide private wishes or tied cloth bid, bibs to remember a child. So I was, I was just enthralled with, with, the, with the way that uh, things had built up uh, within them to let you know so much more about people passing through. Um, there's so many material extremes in Japan too. You know, it's that that was another thing that was interesting to me. There's the intersections and contradictions of new technology and old everywhere, and there's not a lot of space to put or hide anything. So it's amazing how you can be walking in uh, just densely mon mundane. Um, surroundings and suddenly, you know, take the path that goes off into the temple complex and it's just kind of like entering another world. And there, it's not only because of the age of what exists there and the building, but also the natural things that exist there. This is one in which natural has been really curated and trimmed and made into this pathway. But in other situations, the natural is quite wild and chaotic. And so those relationships were things that I was looking at. The most well-known of the uh, temple circuits in Japan is the 88 Temple Circuit, and it winds around the whole island of Shikoku. And so there are, in fact, 88 temples there. Uh, it has many challenging passages, and there's a lot of time of the year that you would not want to try to do that whole thing. Some people, um, it, it would take a couple of months to walk the whole thing, and some people, for many people, it's a life goal there to walk it, um, and some people do it in sections, some people do it by car, bus, trans other forms of transportation, but there are definitely walkers, and I, I saw them. Um, I still have 80 temples to go on, on this one. 
um, my drawings in Japan were studies of spatial relationships made by remembering what I experienced physically. I was not trying to illustrate something. I was trying to uh, learn through physical um, somatic interaction with those particular sites and places and, and then to somehow process that. So while I was there, I worked in much uh, smaller sections. And then when I came back to my studio in Santa Fe, uh, continued to work and then uh, linked a lot of those together so that uh, some of the first pieces I did were about two feet by nine feet long. And then for the past couple of years, I've been working on smaller series. These are about, um, I think they're about uh, 20 inches by 24. And um, they're really narrative abstractions about time and movement. And as I walk, uh, as I work on them, I think that, you know, I think about fictions of place. I think about how important um, sometimes just that containing feeling of space is. So my drawings look like schematics for something architectural. They look like floor plans and the accompanying pathways and um, other things that you see there. I mean, they really are for interpretation. This is, you're looking at, you know, the same drawing process using the tape the stickers, the labels, stitched thread as line, and paint. So I think of those drawing materials as a kind of um, fixed uh, range of building parts that I might have. And I'm able then to use them creatively and push them because there's limits. I mean, they are mostly rectangles and circles, so I'm trying to use them in a way where I can really push them and become, uh, develop a much more, more inventive vocabulary out of a very limited vocabulary. And they relate back to that, what I mentioned at the beginning, my obsession with arranging small parts, uh, bits of, and bits of matter into something that's cohesive. For me, they're like problems that I'm solving. I'm thinking of a particular space. How do I get the quality of that space in a drawing uh, in, in an abstraction? And the works uh, can be shown on their own individually or they are linked up um, in groups. So I've got several series with with many parts. This one has 12 parts. And um, you can see how, on, on that particularly, how one form uh, starts on one page and then builds into the other. And so many of them are like that. Um, and people, when people look at these, they, they tend to get right up on, they're framed, so they'll get right up on the, the, almost on the surface of the frame, looking in to try to follow everything. And so it's a very close viewing, usually. And you can, uh, what happens though too, as you're doing that, you start to notice that the thread, I mean the paper, is translucent, so as you look at them, you're seeing through them, and it takes a few minutes to recognize that. People tend to get a little confused about how they were done because of that. And also, um, I, because I'm doing a lot of stitch line, sometimes the stitch line is cut and becomes a line on the surface, but a lot of times it's pulled to the back and cut, so you can see a little bit of shadowy line behind them, and that also gives a clue that there's a space uh, back there. And so my drawings were always starting points for um, three-dimensional built environments. I had always thought of them that way. It just took, took some long time spending with the drawings to, to finally get up and <laughs> make, make a space. So um, 
what happens, well, first of all, I wanted people to be able to walk and explore and respond in, in these spaces. So I'm wanting to bring them in. Um, essentially what happens is that the drawings uh, predict arch architectural, architectural floor plans and then expand materially. Uh, so the see-through quality of the drawing paper gave me the idea for translucent walls and other aspects of uh, this most recent installation, enveloping space, walk, trace, think. And this was shown earlier this year at Center for Contemporary Art in Santa Fe, which has a new project space for experimental works. So I got to, I got the project space, I think it was the second person using it. So it was really nice and pristine, which I liked. Um, the space had a very, very wide entry that opened up into their other exhibition space. So immediately I wanted to shut that down so that um, there would be a kind of filter in between what was happening out beyond the installation and the entry of the installation. I also wanted to slow down how you would come into it. So people were kind of mesmerized by the cords and also the way the cords are threaded up into a structure on an angle. It looks really like you're looking at the threading of a loom because it goes at a diagonal. And so the cords, if you walk by them really quickly, it's almost like driving by a row of trees that have been planted very precisely. You get this kind of um, effect from it. And people were kind of mesmerized by that and the just the slow movement from air currents of the um, wooden pieces that are on the end. It's just raw pine that's there. Um, and they also, they had two parts where you could enter on either side of the cords. So if you entered on the left, you could go directly to the drawings and look at those. And a lot of people wanted to do that. And then if you entered on the right, um, you would, you could walk by these um, trays on the outer wall right here that have powdered chalk. And then above them mounted on a, a little projecting piece of wood is a wool felt. So my intention was that people would, you know, scoop up some of that chalk and just like put it on the, on the black felt. Uh, I learned some things through that too in terms of what people want to do when presented with materials that they can interact with. There were tiny granules in the powdered chalk. So they would pick the powdered chalk the first night particularly and try to write something. But I tended this one and I came back and swiped. So it was a kind of constant tending for me to like uh, keep building up the chalk on the surface and then eventually people started doing that as well. And as you walked around, you, you could continue that. And it's just something that I have always naturally done. I, I, I kind of always do that. So I wanted that really natural swipe and not so much the graffiti and um, kind of, you know, hallway markings that would come from actually writing there. And then there was a cloth hanging there so you could clean your hands. And as you turn the corner, you come into the center of a couple of layers of framed uh, scrim that's been set up as walls. And these benches um, were made so that um, books and pins were placed in, in openings there. And if you wanted to, you could sit on the bench, you could look back at the drawings, but they've kind of phased out because they were obscured by the scrim and a couple of layers of scrim. Um, or you could open up the books and write, and I had an invitation in the book to um, offer something related to a quote or a story or an observation or an opinion or reminder. Uh, something that kind of escapes us unless we write it down. And these were 
modeled on older books that are called commonplace books. It's a historical version that goes way back into Greek history. And it's books that are written by people who are non-authorities. They're not going to publish them, but they want to keep notes on something of all those things that I just mentioned. I had, I had titled a number of pieces commonplace because I was referring especially some of the fabric pieces with the, the painting on top of the fabric and the, the tension lines because I was referring back to the commonness of our DNA, the fact that our, we're, we're so, we have so much in common. It's just like about you know, a very, very small percentage that we don't have in common. And I was just always wanting to draw attention to that word commonplace. So when I found out there was a commonplace book that went back in history, I felt I had to use it. And so, um, and I came across it just by reading a book that mentioned it. And um, those also, then I found out too, you know, commonplace books where you're just writing things, non-authorities, forming opinions, um, those are like blogs. And so there are commonplace blogs online as well. I was here because I didn't have technology. I wanted to, to, to just go back to the handwriting and, and one thing, kind of savor handwriting as it is these days. Um, and at the same time to see if through my introduction and the things I mentioned there, people would respond. Would they respond to me? Would they respond to the writer that wrote before? Or what would they do? And uh, so I, f I found out that, I found out a lot through the books. Um, by the end of the installation, the books were filled with the drawings. Sometimes, I don't know really why the drawings were there, what they represented. Sometimes they were drawing the installation. Uh, sometimes they were drawing how the, my drawings looked through the scrim. And some diagrams. Uh, they had some entries. Um, they had a few stories. And they had some entries that I would say were equivalent to what one would write in a high school annual. And then fortunately, um, they had many nicely specific comments on the filtering aspect of the space and how much it means these days to be in a calm and protected surround of space and or a s surround of thinking space. So I, I didn't really ask people to comment on the work uh, per se in their writing, but I learned a lot from um, what was written about what, what was really appreciated within the work, and that's very useful for me as I move on to the next and uh, move on to uh, struggling with the question of how to include writing and group writing and that sort of thing in a project that I'm doing. So I, all of that was good input to, to consider for my next place. I hope you can come. And I'm um, going to end with one of my favorite images from Japan, this final image taken at a small shrine in Nora. The large block of ice melting on a piece of cloth on a hot, muggy day says everything I want to convey about time, material, generosity, and coolness.